Correct. Go ahead, Hector. Hey, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, I'm a program analyst with the Center of Prevention Programs and Partnerships at the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, first, I want to thank LULAC for giving us the time to uh, share our grant program, our federal grant program with um, all the LULAC members. Um, and also uh, thank them just for setting up this platform, this video. So uh, this, this information um, is accessible and that everyone has um, access and understands uh, type of uh, programs we're looking to fund and also what our office does. Um, so Center Prevention and Partnership Programs, we're gonna be talking about the, the Targeted Violence and Terror Terrorism Prevention Grant Program. And we'll also be talking about um, what prevention means to the Center of Prevention um, as well. So I'm gonna hand it over to Associate Director uh, David O'Leary, who's going to um, discuss the program with you all. Okay. Thank you, Hector. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm David O'Leary. I'm a Program Director uh, in the Center for Prevention Programs and Partnerships. Um, I wanna welcome you to this afternoon's session. I'm gonna share my screen here. All right. All right, so a lot of acronyms up front. Um, I run the program, uh, the FY 2022 Targeted Violence and Terrorism Prevention Grant Program, TVTP. We'll be, we'll be um, um, defining both of those terms later in the presentation. Uh, Hector and I come from the Center for Prevention Programs and Partnerships, or CP3. And uh, we work at the US Department of Homeland Security. Um, our office has folks in DC like myself and Hector, um, but we also have approximately 15 field reps that we're hoping to grow so that we have at least one in every state over the next several years. Um, but right now we cover all regions of the United States. Um, and you can find out your local regional prevention coordinator on our website. Um, it's the best place to get that information because it does change from time to time. The vision of the center is that we seek a resilient America where communities are united to help end targeted violence and terrorism. And our mission is to work with the whole of society to build local prevention programs, local prevention frameworks, I'm sorry. Um, this, pro, this is a, we want to do this through a public health approach and we'll be describing that in more detail. Um, and we just want to point out that this approach is focused on the health and well-being of individuals and their communities and is multidisciplinary, evidence-based, and proactively places civil rights, civil liberties, and privacy concerns at the forefront of its programs. Um, we wanna use a whole of society engagement. We wanna be involved in all aspects. Uh, we want all aspects of society to be involved in the effort of prevention from technology, uh, arts and entertainment, government at all levels, um, advocacy organizations, faith-based, community level organizations, recreation, et cetera. We also will need to be connected to law enforcement at certain points, but really this is not about um, arrests or investigations. This is about prevention prior to that. All right, a few definitions. A targeted violence is a bit of an umbrella term, and it refers to any intentional act against a pre-identified target based on that target's perceived identity or affiliation that is intended to intimidate or coerce or generate publicity about a perpetrator's grievance. Terrorism, which fits under that, refers specifically to violence committed in the name of ideology to further a political or social agenda. Now, the Department of Homeland Security was um, developed with the, one of the, with the primary mission of preventing terrorism, which is why we talk about terrorism uh, throughout this, this presentation. But we are also looking in the larger end of targeted violence. What we found, and when we get into some of the risk factors and behavioral indicators, is that they are common across different types of targeted, different types of terrorism. So white supremacist violent extremists or, um, uh, or uh, uh, anti-government violent extremists um, to international terrorism like ISIS, Al Qaeda, the risk factors are similar across all those as are they with individuals that um, have workplace violence or school shootings. Um, uh, they all uh, have so share some of the same risk factors. Radicalization of violence is the process wherein an individual comes to believe that the threat or use of unlawful violence is necessary or even justified to accomplish a goal. So you can take um, 
you can think of an example um, where you believe that the threat or use of violence is necessary. You haven't committed a crime yet at that point. You're just in the space where you're able to. You're ready to if, if, if needed or you're able, you want to support violence as the solution. I wanted to point out though that in the United States that ideology regardless of the cause it supports is protected. It's the unlawful force or violence on behalf of an ideology that is not protected. Um, I want to speak a little bit about how I got into prevention. Um, uh, after I was in high school on 9-11 and wanted to uh, participate um, and was moved by that and wanted to be in government and in security to prevent that from happening again. Uh, I joined DHS in 2008. And over those first several years, we were very much focused on terrorists coming from outside of the United States to try to attack us, mainly through the aviation sector. We put a lot of protection into federal buildings. We put a lot of protection at the airport, layers of protection around the country. Um, and we largely um, have been successful in stopping terrorist attacks from individuals coming from abroad. What we've had difficulty with in the years after 2010 uh, into 2012, et cetera, um, is individuals who were born here and radicalized to violence, um, either because they adhered to a foreign terrorist ideology like ISIS or Al Qaeda, or they, uh, what has been common in the United States for hundreds of years since the founding, they subscribe to domestic terrorism movements like white supremacist violent extremism. Um, around 2013, we started to see more HVE attacks. Think of the Boston bombing in 2013. My brother uh, lived on the marathon route and was out um, at the baseball game that the Red Sox always play that year on Marathon Monday. Um, I grew up going to those events and he was out that day. I was in DC at DHS and uh, we couldn't get in touch with him for quite a while. And then he was involved in a lockdown for the next 24 hours while they searched for the terrorists. Um, and then a few years later, again, another foreign inspired attack uh, on the Pulse nightclub in 2016. Uh, as a member of the LGBTQ community, that affects me to this day. Um, and as many of you know, probably know, um, that was on uh, Latinx night at the Pulse nightclub. Uh, and about 90% of those killed that day were Latinx. Um, so a lot of these individuals had touched law enforcement, but at the time they hadn't committed any crimes when the FBI investigated them. And similarly, we have individuals who are related to domestic terrorist events, uh, they, um, or domestic terrorist movements who again, may have popped up on police radar or may have been involved, may have been involved in the community where somebody might've seen something that was concerning to them and if they had said the right thing or done the right thing, may have been able to prevent uh, that attack or a similar type of attack. So when we think about prevention in this space, we don't think about the law enforcement investigations that might find these people or stop them and put them behind bars. We think about what can we do to prevent the radicalization of terrorism in the first place? Um, and uh, the main thing we can do is we have primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention. Uh, in the case of uh, in, in the case of radicalization, you can think of prevention as falling off, uh, stopping someone from falling off the cliff of radicalization. And you can do that by putting a fence up and have programs that increase protective factors and de increase and decrease risk factors. And we'll talk a little bit more about what those are. But an example of a primary prevention program would be a jobs program, bystander awareness. Um, youth resiliency, digital media and literacy, something that would stop somebody from ever becoming radicalized in the first place if they had that and other support from their community. Secondary prevention is when somebody begins to radicalize. And again, the definition of radicalization of violence is come to believe that the threat or use of unlawful violence is necessary or even justified to accomplish the goal. They may say something, and again, we'll go over some of the, some of the indicators uh, here in a second, um, but there are there are prevention in the secondary space, like having a bystander intervene, referring someone to a threat assessment or management program, um, etc. After um, somebody has already committed an act of hate or extremist violence, 
um, they may be eligible for a tertiary prevention program, um, which is recidivism reduction, which is this box here. So a lot of everything in primary and secondary is considered over here, trust building, engagement, awareness building, intervention. When none of that works, we do expect that law enforcement will intervene either hopefully before the fact, but certainly afterwards. Um, and it's not always that we're looking at recidivism. Some of these times, if, we, if the perpetrator's alive, they'll be in prison for a long time. But think of individuals who may have just done graffiti on a community center, um, you know, yell the racial slur in a classroom. Um, individuals who may have punishment as a result, um, they may touch the criminal justice system or they may touch the discipline system at a school. Um, but we can stop that from, um, we can stop that from accelerating into something, into another crime. Um, and again, the purpose of this is not to criminalize individuals, but it's to stop them from entering, getting to the criminal place. Because once they're at the point ready to use violence, we don't wanna just hope that the police catch on to it. We want to have been there um, preventing it from the first place so we don't need the police to intervene. Um, there are a lot of factors that can in, in fact influence someone's radicalization of violence from an individual factor, like a job loss, a relationship breaking up, or um, experiencing discrimination, relationship factors. Um, this is interpersonal factors, so dehumanizing those different from us. Community factors like mistrust of government or perceived attacks on shared values or interests. And societal factors, perceived injustice towards a group. Keeping in mind that no single factor uh, leads to radicalization, these are not predictive, and an individual may possess some or all of these factors and not radicalize to violence. Um, I mentioned that um, going into, you know, 26, 2015, um, you know, we were mostly looking at foreign uh, terrorist organizations targeting um, American targets. Um, we started to see after that an uptick in, um, in uh, domestic terrorism, specifically an uptick in violent white supremacy. A chief example of that would be the 2019 attack on El Paso, which deeply affected Latinx communities, affected the DHS community with the Border Patrol and our workers there in the El Paso region. Our acting secretary at the time was, came up through the Border Patrol and a number of the people who died were members of families of members of the Border Patrol. So deeply impacted us. And as a result, we, um, um, we um, had some new funding come to, the, come to my office to help prevent that type of attack from happening again. And you can look at these primary domestic terrorism grievances, anti-religion, racism, high on there, immigration, civil unrest, the election outcome, all of these are primary domestic terrorism grievances currently. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about what, uh, what we can do uh, specifically with our funding. Um, we anticipate that we'll be provided $20 million from Congress. They're finishing up that budget deal um, in the next week or so, week or two. Um, and then uh, we hope that once they finish that up, we'll be able to release our notice of funding in mid-March, 2022. Um, so in just a few weeks here, there's a lot that people can do to start their applications now. Um, and we'll get on, we'll, we'll help you with some of those resources. And then also uh, it'll be open for about 60 days after it's released. And then we're gonna announce awards in, um, it's probably gonna be in September. It says late August there, but I think it'll be in September now. We have eight project types that we're hoping folks will apply for. Um, Raising societal awareness, uh, media literacy and online critical thinking initiatives, civic engagement, youth resilience, threat assessment and management teams, bystander training, referral services, and the recidivism reduction and reintegration. Each of those has a target funding amount. Uh, and you can apply for more than one project type in your community. So if you add these up, you can start to see how we got to our average target funding, our average funding amount in last year was about $540,000. So if you're thinking about what, what is the total amount that folks typically get, that's the average. Uh, if there are projects that don't fit within these project types, uh, we, we do have an innovation track um, that was reserved for about 25 to 30% of the funding. And that's at 300,000 to 750,000. 
what we're it's very competitive track so we're really looking for things that don't quite fit into these project types and again one of the things you can find on our website is a link to last year's notice of funding opportunity uh, as well as um, uh, as well as some guides so you can really kind of look at what these projects are going for I mentioned this already the average award amount um, the projects are for 24 months so those aren't annual budgets it's the total amount divided over the 24 months would be your monthly operating budget or just um, you know if you need to if you're bringing people on for salary knowing that you only have the, the funds available for 24 months and that would start in October of this year and run through September of 2024. Our eligible applicants uh, include local, state, uh, territorial and tribal governments, um, nonprofits with 501c3 status, and institutions of higher education. Uh, we are very much looking to increase our, um, our work in underserved and marginalized communities. Um, that can happen through any of these organizations. It could happen through minority serving institutions um, uh, or through nonprofits or local governments in predominantly um, historically marginalized communities. A couple elements of the program to keep in mind that may not be amenable to what you have in mind for funding. We are looking for sustainability. So we would like to see us fund your capability for two years and then for it to be sustainable with either additional funds or um, at low cost to your base budgets for you to continue on the capability following the period of performance. I'd love to sustain projects that do a really good job, but we don't have the funding uh, to continue to pay the same recipients for the same capability year after year. We really need to try to kickstart as many of these capabilities as we can across the country. Measurement, we have an implementation and measurement plan that is part of the application. And measuring the results of these awards is really key to what we do um, because we are trying to take our promising practices and turn them into best practices. And we're trying to take those innovation projects that we fund and turn those into best practices as well. We do that through measuring results. All right, some of the technical assistance we offer. Um, let me see if this, let me just control click, see if this opens. All right, so here's our website. Let's see, does it go to, it opens in the background. All right, so you can see on this site, if I'm sharing this, um, you can find the last year's notice of funding opportunity right here. It's a big document, otherwise we'd email it to everybody. But there's a link to it right here, as well as descriptions of all the um, all the projects we funded last year. On our main um, uh, on when on the re on our resources site, we have five different areas where you can get more resources. Sorry, this is small. This is a screenshot. So when you click through to our resources, these will be bigger, but. Uh, we have instructional videos. If you're a first time applicant, some of our IT systems, government IT systems, um, aren't the best. So there's some instructional videos here, grants.gov and our non disaster grants program, uh, videos on how to use those. We have a whole library of prevention uh, publications on all different elements of prevention. Um, there's probably 30 or 40 articles there that are useful um, for you to read. Um, if you're just learning about preventing targeted violence and terrorism. Uh, if you've never applied for federal grants, we have how to guides on each of the steps you need to do to apply. And you can start all of these now, including getting an employee identification number, registering with ND grants, getting a system for award management number, SAM. Um, and then you can also start thinking about your implementation and measurement plan, as well as looking at last year's notice to see what the um, the application structure is. And then also um, we have a, a link here, additional grant resources. If this program is not um, for you, we have some information on other grant programs at DHS and other federal agencies that might be useful to what you're trying to accomplish in your community. Um, then we have um, an implementation and measurement plan section, which really walks through how to, how to fill that out and, um, it really lets us lay out and see what you're doing when, at what part of the project. So it's really helpful for us to see exactly what, um, what we're funding. And then um, we have some webinars as well, similar to this, but more topical based. They're not based on whichever audience we're speaking to. They're based on 
with topics like metrics and measurement, or uh, we also have a grantee panel of, of, previous, of current recipients on their application experience, and we may be adding some more there. Additionally, um, we have a, uh, addition, in addition to the website resources, we can do targeted webinars like this. Um, if there's another uh, need for this for other folks that couldn't make it or can't watch the recording or we'd like to have uh, more information, uh, we can do that as well with another organization um, if you'd like to bring that back. Uh, we have an email help desk. We have limited availability for phone or um, virtual uh, support, uh, but we may be able to do that upon request. Um, it's a competitive program, so every eligible application is scored. Um, you can see the scoring criteria and the point breakdown in our last year's opportunity, but I uh, just point out that some of that may change, so you want to make sure that when the NOFO is released in the middle of, this, of next month that you compare to, the, to uh, this year's scoring uh, figures, but you can get a sense of what they are now. It's the categories are staying roughly the same. Um, so we do offer, if you're not, most of our applications, it's their first time applying. Um, but um, if you're unsuccessful the first round, we do provide feedback calls to help you, to help identify where your application could be improved uh, for next year. And then also we, we can um, uh, get in touch with you via our regional prevention coordinators that are based in your local communities, or at least in your region. Um, and they may be able to um, identify others working in your region on prevention that you might want to collaborate on an application with, but they cannot assist you with actually writing the applications. And then lastly, um, uh, we'll put in the chat here um, this link here, but you can sign up for our Gov Delivery, which is our email listserv. Uh, when you click on that link, um, which we'll put in the chat here in a second, uh, you'll enter your email, it'll take you to an approval page where you approve the privacy policy, and then from there, um, you just want to make sure to select Center for Prevention Programs and Partnerships, and then um, you'll get any email updates, including when the notice is released. Um, if we put new um, documents up on our website um, that might be of assistance, we usually put out a notice through that, through that email list as well. I'll leave that up. exit full screen here. All right, let me see if there's some questions here. Yeah, right now, um, we don't have any materials in Spanish, although we are intending to translate them. Uh, and we can um, definitely share that with LULAC um, when we do have the translated materials available. Um, we don't have the ability this year to receive applications in Spanish, um, although we know it might be helpful to have the um, some of the instructions or awareness materials in Spanish, and we are looking to get those translated. All right, maybe there's some questions in the. Yeah, we have some questions. Yeah, we've, um, so we've shared the presentation with LULAC and we'll um, ask if they have a way to get that out to you all or host it for you so you can download it. All right. Yep, you can, we do not allow, uh, so another question is, is um, must you be a 501c3 to qualify or personal? So it, you, we don't allow individuals to apply, it is for an organization only. Is there a population expectation rural versus urban? Uh, our, uh, one of our um, selection factors is uh, making sure that the final selections have a diversity of, um, of geography to include not just region of the country, but also rural, urban, or suburban. So we do have, um, we want to have a, a diversity of those types. Let's see. I did say that I would talk about the risk factors a little bit. Um, 
I can pull those up from a longer presentation here and talk about what some of these risk factors are. So some of the risk factors that we see and that we'd like to see programs alleviate are, um, these are specifically for, and let me give you a definition. So a risk factor is a characteristic that increases the likelihood of a person becoming a perpetrator of targeted violence or terrorism. It does not predict or cause targeted violence or terrorism. But this is like a risk factor, like uh, what's a risk factor for speeding? Oh, I'm running late. Um, or, um, you know, I don't know what the speed limit is on this road. So you can post more. How do we do that? You post more speed limit signs would alleviate one risk factor. Another risk factor would be, you know, not being late, but that, I'm never going to fix that. Um, a protective factor um, is a characteristic that decreases the likelihood of a person becoming a perpetrator of targeted violence and terrorism. A protective factor provides a buffer against risk. So um, think of it like, um, so having uh, mental health issues, so suffering a bout of depression would be, could be, is considered a risk factor for radicalization of violence. But a protective factor in this case would be if you had a really supportive family. Um, and so therefore, uh, any depression you might have, you'd be supported by your family and you'd be able to get through it without any negative consequences. Um, let's see. Uh, let me give a few more examples. I see one or two other questions here, uh, but let me just describe some more of these risk factors and protective factors. Um, using two different mice on two different computers. All right, so like risk factors are for terrorism are a history of criminal violence, associating with terrorists, having a deep commitment to an extremist ideology, psychological issues, unemployment, inadequate education, lower socioeconomic status, difficulty achieving aspirations, difficulty in relationships, having suffered abuse, being distanced from one's family, being alone. Um, for targeted violence, you can add in um, substance use and abuse. These are all from research. Um, psychological issues, uh, trouble in family or romantic relationships, social problems like being bullied, a lot of these are, are um, overlap. And some of the protective factors that we're looking to instill are um, that you might find in a, a youth resilience program or otherwise would be having self-esteem, having strong ties to the community, having a nuanced understanding of ideologies, including religion, parental involvement, uh, exposure to nonviolent belief systems, um, a diversity of nonviolent outlets for addressing grievances, societal inclusion and integration, uh, ability to process emotions in healthy, productive ways, and resources to ad address trauma and mental health issues. All right, we have two questions here. Do you have people with intellectual disability as a target population? Um, so uh, to, to answer this question, um, and ask a follow-up if I'm not understanding it right. But as far as I know, so there's um, so there might be a target population that you're working with to say we want to either one protect this population from outside attack, so protect individuals with intellectual disability from targeted violence, or um, um, uh, so that's if that's it that we want to protect them. Um, I don't believe we have a project like that before, but that's not. But that is something that could be um, part of our program. Uh, or if you're referring to, uh, we don't have any research uh, that uh, links um, individuals with intellectual disabilities as being a risk factor for targeted violence or terrorism. So. Um, if I didn't answer that question, feel free to type a um, type a follow on. All right, there is a question about um, that their council is under the national LULAC umbrella. So I would I would have to um, probably uh, refer you to uh, LULAC specifically um, to find out um, how that might work as being part of the. They may have to apply on your behalf. I'm just not sure how your organization is operated. All right, uh, here's another question. Referral services can be for connecting Hispanic people that have needs to local government agencies and organizations 
that can address the needs, addressing the feeling of disconnect and reducing anxiety. Yeah, so um, absolutely. I think, so referral services absolutely could be um, understanding what, um, what the uh, local government, the city or the town has available, or if there's a state um, behavioral health department facility in the community or um, social services or uh, uh, adult education, things like that, uh, or getting them enrolled in the right schools definitely would be something that could be covered as part of a community-wide uh, prevention framework. One of, our, one of the things that we've been pushing lately um, is to have more threat assessment and management teams. Um, a lot of times with these, these can identify issues early on. Um, and, um, and then they um, don't necessarily have to elevate to a law enforcement solution. So especially in a community, in communities, um, you know, some communities have great relationship with their, with their police or sheriffs and others do not. And we recognize that. In ones where you do have, where you don't have a great relationship, having a threat assessment uh, and management team in a community that can handle issues where you know someone has you know some some behavioral issues, but they're not quite criminal, it may help um, be a solution to that problem that is not law enforcement centered. Um, because a lot of people don't want to involve the police, um, and and the police aren't experts at solving every crisis, right? We know that. Um, so my advice, if you're, uh, so another question is if they're waiting for a 501c3 um, registration. So my advice is to make sure you've got all that paperwork in. Um, you have to have it um, before you can submit your final application. Um, so you need to have that, the, you need to be established as 501c3 and then have that reflected in your system for award management account, which you'll need to submit the app on grants.gov. It's a little complicated, and if you, um, uh, so my advice would be to check up on that registration and get it finalized as soon as possible. You may need up to four weeks, so the, the second half of the application period should be enough time to finish the system for award management. So I would say if you get your 501c3 registration by the end of March, early April, you should still have plenty of time to apply this year. Right, so I talked about um, risk factors and protective factors. Um, those, are, those are very useful um, for developing early or primary prevention programs, like I, like I mentioned. Um, but um, the, next, the next kind of category of, of, of factors that we look at would be, we actually, they're indicators, they're actual behavior. So the ideology, the, um, the radicalization itself, is not against the law you know it's you know the think about think about a sports fan we call them fanatics right um we've used that term for radicals too right so you know you can have you can have these people that you know believe that you know if they breathe wrong in a baseball game the other team's gonna win uh, that they don't that they don't root for so you know think about people like that where if you started to see somebody all of a sudden they were a casual baseball fan and all of a sudden they're going to, um, you know, uh, you know, every home game. They're tweeting about it nonstop. They're listening to talk radio. That's all they talk about. Well, you can see how that's a progression of indicators there, and we have the same indicators of radicalization of violence um, in um, as well from research. So expressing or accepting of violence as necessary means to achieve ideological goals. Consuming or sharing violent extremist videos, media, and or messaging, retweeting or linking to violent extremists, participating in online sites or groups that provoke violence, verbalizing their intent, making violent outbursts. Um, with relation to um, also uh, engaged in prior threatening or concerning communication, threatening someone, including their target making statements either verbally, visually, in writing or online that were not necessarily threatening, but were concerning. Making paranoid statements, sharing videos of previous mass attacks, vague statements about imminent death, 
a preoccupation or fixation with the person, activity, ideology, to the point where it negatively impacts their life, including a preoccupation with death or previous attacks. So all these things would indicate that we would want to use a secondary prevention tool like a threat assessment and management team. Some of these things are outright illegal and may want to be investigated by the police, but some of these things like um, you know, making paranoid statements, sharing violent videos that maybe they don't provide any context to, um, that's something where either an engaged bystander like a friend or family member um, or clergy or community leader would want to get involved. If there's any threat of imminent harm, you'd want to contact the police. But in these in instances, um, the police may not be able to do something. There's an interesting fact that's arise on um, targeted violence, which is in two thirds of attacks, I'm sorry, in two thirds of cases, attackers exhibited behaviors that elicited concern in other people ahead of time. And if they had a threat assessment and management team or some referral services that they could connect to, um, then they would have then potentially that threat may have been alleviated. Um, and you can, you want to, uh, there's a lot, uh, threat assessment teams are easy to establish, well, not easy, but they're relatively straightforward. There's actually a lot of available training on threat assessment and management that's pretty accessible. From a commercial standpoint, there's like several reputable providers that provide that service. Um, and um, you just need to find a, a group of committed folks. Multidisciplinary is key to a good threat assessment and management team. So you can imagine one in a school that would include maybe an administrator, maybe um, someone who taught uh, uh, some teachers. You might have um, sports staff from the athletics department or something like that. So truly multidisciplinary. And you may bring in for consultation as needed the school resource officer, but again, not in every situation. All right, let me see um, if there, I'm gonna see if there are any more questions. Um, uh, so one of the things we can provide um, through the technical assistance, if you have questions, we don't necessarily, um, if you are working on an application and you want us to talk to you, what we can't do is, you know, have you brief us on what your plan is and then say, um, what 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 could we do to improve it? We can't really answer open-ended questions like that. So think of if you're really stuck and you kind of want a little bit of help, um, come to us with a question that's more um, that's more closed. Like I'm thinking about this is what I'm thinking about. I'm not sure which of the application tracks or which of the project types it best fits towards. And we can try to help you um, uh, with that. Um, uh, with that, uh, with that question, and try to direct you to the right um, area. All right. Let me just see if there's any more questions here that we haven't answered yet, either in the Q and A or the chat. I'm not seeing them. So. Um, if you need to get in touch with us with extra questions, we really welcome you doing so via our email at terrorismprevention at hq.dhs.gov. Um, let me put the website address back up there. dhs.gov slash TVTP, Targeted Violence and Terrorism Prevention Grants. Uh, that's where you can find those resources. And uh, we are really hoping that this year our awards can better reflect um, uh, better reflect the uh, the diversity of our country. Um, and we think a large part of that is that um, we're not getting the word out about this opportunity to every community in the country at this point. So uh, we hope that you can spread the word with other uh, with your own, within your own organizations and with other Latinx serving. Um, uh, organizations as well. Uh, let's see. Uh, will the PowerPoint be available 
uh, online. So yes, we shared the PowerPoint with um, with Jorge before the presentation, and um, I believe they will be able to. Get, I believe Lulac will be able to get that out as a follow on or provide that as requested. All right, with that, we will end today's presentation.